Is this why uh, girls are menstruating earlier and earlier now? Absolutely. Uh, it used to be the case that the average age for a young lady to start uh, menstruation was somewhere between 13 and 14 years of age, and today the average age is 10.7 years. Even, um, actually you say 13 and 14, in the 19th century it was much earlier even, and much later even than that, it was, it was between 15 and 18 was the normal time for menstruation. Amazing. So we've had, we've had that age move back mm -hmm. and back and back until now. Um, you even see some eight-year-olds who are menstruating, is Absolutely. that true? Yes. And what do doctors say about this? Are, are they concerned? Well, I think that they're concerned, but I think that they've just accepted it as a norm, even though it's just like any other testing process. Um, <clears throat> for example, you can look at, um, uh, say for example, sperm counts. You know, if you were to look at sperm counts, say 50 years ago, there was a certain level that was acceptable and was considered to be the norm, the average, the normal amount. Well, today, uh, when they're giving you a normal or average amount, uh, that would be um, much, much less than what it was 50 years ago. And it's because that's <clears throat> what they're testing is a normal or average amount for today's population. So a normal or average time for today's population would be 10.7 years. And of course, you're gonna have outliers on either side of that. And, and so doctors would consider an eight-year-old uh, who has started her period to not be uncommon. I was going to ask you if men and boys are as affected by this, and you, and you mentioned sperm count, so I would imagine that men and boys indeed are as affected as girls and women. Absolutely. Uh, they are affected, and uh, particularly in men, uh, one of the areas that we see that, that there is a high impact uh, would be the area of uh, prostate disease. Um, benign prostate hyperplasia, uh, where you're, you're just having an enlarged uh, prostate gland. Uh, the prostate is definitely um, affected by estrogen, and uh, we do see that in men. You have an interesting story yourself about um, your own hormonal imbalance mm -hmm. and how it was treated. Can you, would you share that with us? Sure. Um, I was in a, in a position, uh, as are many women across the United States, uh, after having giving birth to my three children, uh, I found myself in a position of just having really abnormal periods. I thought it was something that uh, was hereditary because every woman in my family had gone through the same and most of them ended up having hysterectomies because they had become severely anemic. Well, I was in that position. I had become severely anemic. I had tried traditional medicine approaches and had, had failed. And I was at a point where I was, was, it had such an impact on me that I was not able to work, or it was really difficult for me to work uh, because I was having such heavy bleeding. And so uh, really was getting ready to have a hysterectomy because I didn't see any other option. And that was when I was introduced to natural progesterone and uh, it absolutely prevented me from having to have the hysterectomy. Now explain to me what you mean by natural progesterone and okay. how is it administered? When I talk about natural progesterone, what I'm really talking about is, um, excuse me, bioidentical uh, progesterone or bioidentical hormones. And what I mean there is if you were to take a molecule of progesterone out of my body and you analyzed it, and then you take a molecule of what we call natural progesterone or bioidentical progesterone and you analyze it, they're identical. Okay, so it might be, and in most cases, it's from a plant source, okay, it's a plant progesterone. Uh, however, the molecular structure is identical to that that's within our body. And so because of that, uh, my body views it as its own, okay? But too much of anything isn't good. So just because it's natural wouldn't necessarily make it a good thing. So how, and especially with you talking about hormonal imbalance, how do you make sure then that, that in applying this natural progesterone, you're not giving yourself too much? How, how do you achieve a balance without then mm -hmm. creating an overbalance of progesterone? Right. Well, what needs to happen is, uh, I, I believe as women, uh, we need to uh, learn to listen to our bodies. We need to know that symptoms that we're having are not normal. That's your body's signal that there's something wrong, whether it's a migraine headache, headache or whatever. There's something going wrong within the body, and so we need to learn to, to listen to that. I think today it's hard for people to listen to what their body's saying because uh, we're basically uh, you know, over-medicated in many cases or taking a pill for this or that, and so that masks symptoms a lot of times. But certainly you can get too much progesterone, 
and uh, there are guidelines uh, that are that are put forth uh, that should be used and those gu guidelines as long as those are followed are very safe. And how do you apply this natural progesterone? Well, do you take it as a pill? Do you inject it? It's actually transdermal. There are other approaches. Transdermal meaning on the skin. Yes, it goes on the skin just as if you were to use a patch uh, for, uh, you know, we, we use transdermal medications in medicine all the time, whether it's a blood pressure medication, a pain control medication, uh, hormones, whatever, come in patch form. Same thing here, only it's not a patch. It's uh, actually distributed through a cream base and it's just applied transdermally and absorbed into the body. Any particular part of the body? We like to tell people soft tissues, uh, any place where the skin is thin and you can see blood vessels uh, running through. So the, of course the, the arm here is a good place, the neck and chest would be a good place as well. The abdomen can be a good place. What is estrogen dominance? I mean you talk about hormonal imbalance mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that you consider the most serious imbalance is what you call estrogen dominance. Can you mm -hmm. explain what that is? Sure. Estrogen dominance is, is just a syndrome where um, the individual has been exposed to too much estrogen. Uh, they've got too much estrogen uh, in their body and uh, you know it's stored and it ends up um, causing a lot of problems. Um, uh, many of the health problems that we discussed earlier, sometimes it can manifest as uh, endometriosis, fibroid tumors, irregular periods. We talked about infertility. Uh, some believe that fibromyalgia has a link to estrogen dominance as well. And typically the person who has estrogen dominance has a particular look to them. And uh, a lot of times they will notice that they've been gaining weight for no particular reason. They've not really done anything differently in their life. Um, however, they're gaining you know, maybe 10 pounds a year. And a lot of times the, the fat uh, that they're gaining is distributed around their middle and then on the thighs. Um, let's talk a little bit about reproductive cancers. Or, or, or before we do that, in the estrogen dominance, how do you then, is the progesterone then counteracting um, this estrogen dominance that you're talking about? Is that why you give progesterone to women? Yes, exactly. Progesterone is antagonistic or uh, goes against the estrogen and keeps it in balance. And so that's why uh, most women throughout the country, if you look at their lifestyle, uh, you will see that they, that they do have estrogen dominance. And so most women can benefit from natural progesterone. Explain to us what xenoestrogens are and is that what is contributing to hormonal imbalance in many okay. people? Xenoestrogens, uh, that's just a term that's, that's been coined uh, to describe false estrogens. Uh, estrogens that really occur within the environment, uh, many of them are coming from chemicals that we're exposed to and uh, they basically have the ability, uh, many of them, to bind to estrogen receptors. And uh, those can be things uh, like dioxin, uh, which is a chemical that's emitted from plastic uh, when plastics are heated up. Um, and there are various other chemicals as well, uh, a lot of uh, insecticides, uh, fungicides, dry cleaning chemicals, just a, a lot of chemicals that we use in our day-to-day -day life that uh, probably are not going to hurt us to have minimal exposure to. However, if you take a lifetime of exposure or 20 years of exposure, then it can co contribute uh, to a problem. Xenoestrogens are really what you were describing earlier in the show when you were talking about animal feed and putting, putting estrogen, feeding animals estrogen and then we consume it. So all the different types of estrogens that are in the environment, either naturally or, or synthetically. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, we have known, uh, most people don't know this, but we've known for more than 100 years that synthetic estrogens causes, cause cancer. Doctors traced cancer of the scrotum in chimney sweeps in the 1890s um, to the tar and the petroleum they were exposed to in their jobs. So we, the medical community has known for a very, very long time that synthetic estrogens cause cancer. Today, what kind of cancers do we trace to those synthetic estrogens? You mentioned prostate problems and prostate cancer. Right, prostate and exactly prostate cancer can be linked uh, and probably the most common is breast cancer. You know, if you go back and you ask uh, your grandmother, uh, how many people did you know who had breast cancer uh, when you were in your 30s or when you were in your 40s? It's likely that she will tell you none. She might tell you that she knew one person. And today we're faced with one out of eight women will develop breast cancer.